Hey guys, it's Tom. Thanks for watching. I had a question on one of my mixed tutorial videos about what you do to deliver a project. Uh, and I went through, you know, the creative stuff of setting your session up and mixing and getting things to where they sound good, but I didn't really cover the deliverables aspect. The deliverables are what you actually hand off to the production when you're finished. So it's the files. And uh, if you watch my mix tutorials one through three, you'll see how to set up your session to print everything. But after you print it, uh, you've got to make sure everything's named right. And you also have to be able to make changes when it goes through QC or if inevitably the director or producer is like, hey, we just need you to change this one thing. So there's a couple different ways to do it. The old fashioned way is to just highlight the range of uh, the entire film. And then you'll need to make sure your session is set up for either interleaved or not interleaved, depending on what the spec sheet calls for. A lot of people just want to deal with the individual audio files. So for a 5.1, that would be .l, .r, .c, .lfe, .ls, .rs, and that goes for all the stems too. So multi-mono files. Some of them will want interleaved files, so you can check that, and that way when you record, it'll make the files that you want. Now, if you're doing this the old school way, which is just a real-time record, you'll also have to go into disk allocation and make sure that your record tracks are set for where you want them. And you can just set this to uh, your a print master folder where you have folders for your 5.1 ME, uh, 5.1 mix, 5.1 DME, and then stereo flavors of that too. Uh, but you'll have to set it up for each show. It might have different, you know, undipped or dip stems or whatever. So this is just basically setting each one of these tracks to be in its own subfolder. That way, after you hit record, you can upload the whole set of folders or drop it on a drive. And there will be an audio files folder in there that people have to go through. But this is like the original old school way to do it. And it's nice because it's real time. You can watch the show down and kind of QC it as you watch it um, or just glory in your mix you've done. And when it's finished, then you're you're ready to send the files off. Since I don't know which version of Pro Tools, but you can do an offline bounce. So you do uh, option command B to bring that up. And you can see here you can uh, it's called bounce mix in the latest versions of Pro Tools. You can bounce this faster than real time. Uh, each one of your record tracks. So you want to set this to your record tracks, not your auxes, but after the limiters, after everything, set it to the input of these tracks right here. So you'll have to do that for each one. You want to import after each bounce. Uh, here you can select if you want to do multiple mono 2448 and then tell it where to go. So if you want it to go in your mix session, that's great. You can say, you know, a uh, session folder and bounce files. I like to put it on like a different drive, Dropbox or something. That way I'm not reading and writing to the same drive. But basically you do this, you hit bounce and you'll get a window that comes up telling you, hey, it's going at five times normal speed. The, when it's done, the tracks will come into your session and then you drag them up onto these tracks. So either one of those two ways that you do it, real-time bounce or offline bounce, you will end up with the printed tracks in your session. You can see if I zip down here, I've got my dialogue and music and Foley and sound effects and backgrounds and, and all kinds of stuff. This is a horror film, so there's a there's quite a few tracks. Um, but what what's great about this is whether you offline bounce or real-time bounce, you should be able to destructively punch in for any changes. So after you send these files out, they get QC'd and they say, hey, there is a tick at 520018. You can see here, they didn't offset the video by an hour, so we're dealing with amateur hour on the time code. Uh, then you just right click on the record button and go to destructive. And just like you would record onto these tracks, see how they're all input enabled? You do shift option record and just select where you want to punch into like that. Make sure you have some pre and post roll, and you want the pre and post roll to be a second or two longer than your longest reverb. So usually pre roll you can get by with less, uh, but let's see, pre roll will do seven, post roll will do seven. See how that's green? The other way you can enable it is Command K. So if you look here, 
See that little flag guy is white. That means he's not pre-rolled. And then orange means it is pre-rolled. Then you just uh, hit your record arm. See it's armed. It's armed right here. And then you hit play and you can punch in your files. Make sure, however, that your session is set to the same file type, interleaved or not interleaved, as the files that you made. So if you offline bounce interleaved and you try to punch in non-interleaved, it won't work. It's going to make a new file. But if you do punch into your offline bounce uh, and it's the same you know, format, either interleaved or not interleaved, it should be seamless. What you'll have to do after you punch in is then... Uh, let's just check this stereo mix here. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna punch into this. This mix is finished. It has been delivered. I don't want to mess with it. Uh, it's been through QC and everything. But what you would do is you'd punch into it. So you'd hit record, record it through. You'll see this turn red, and then go back through, take it out of input mode, and actually listen to the audio file to make sure that there's no tick. Sometimes with really low frequency stuff, there will be a tick or any plugins that don't process the audio the same way. Usually that's the weirder plugins, not just EQs, but like the more bizarre, crazy sound design plugins out there. But anything that involves low frequency content has a tendency to tick. So you, sometimes you have to go in and make sure that you're punching in, not during like a rumbly low frequency part. The other thing you can do to kind of make it work without ticking is if you look here on here's a transient noise right here right so what you can do to help your punches is set the end point to be right before the transient if there is a tiny little microscopic tick but you punch in right on that impact it should be completely inaudible like it's just going to be a part of the snap and it shouldn't mess with the transient and then you know you pick the out where you want to go the way i learned was that you want to make your punches in the valleys of the audio so quiet spots like here this is just like ambience i guess you know if i wanted to punch that that'd be a good selection but i have found like i said if i do it on a transient sometimes it can work in problematic sections so punch it check your punch and then the other thing you want to do is make sure that your files are named something that makes sense at the very least when you're naming these files you want to have the name of the project a date, what the file is, and the channel layout. So if it's if it's a 5.1 or we call it a six track sometimes mix, you know, surround mix, label the file that. If it's a stereo, label it stereo. If it's 7.1 or Dolby Atmos or mono, God forbid, you know, name it what it is. That way these files are going to get shuffled around and people aren't looking for, well, I have an L and an R, but I don't have a C. Is this LCR? Is it stereo? Is it 5.1? And dating the file also makes it to where when you do versions, because they will come back with QC fixes or a hey, would you note, you know, at 2 a.m. on a Friday, and they're like, hey, we just need you to change this one thing or change this line or, hey, we cut this out. If you date stamp the files, they can trace it back through each version. That gives you some peace of mind for, you know, hey, which file is this that I'm sending? Um, and yeah, it just makes everybody happier. One thing I've been doing since I work remotely most of the time is I will just print these files to Dropbox. Uh, and it's maybe a little risky. There could be some sync issues, but I've got the Dropbox app and sync feature enabled on my computer. For example, here's a 5.1 dm &E for this mix. These files are all synced. Uh, they're on Dropbox. I've got the 5.1 mix here. I've got the 5.1 M&E, the stereo dm &E, the stereo mix which is an interleaved file. This was for a screener, so that's why it's not .l and .r. And then a stereo m and &E. And what's great about doing this is if I then have just a little fix, there's one tick or there's a line that needs to be nudged or something like that, I don't have to re-upload 40 gigs of audio for that one little fix. I'll destructively punch into these files in Dropbox. So in Pro Tools, you know, just like I talked about, uh, you know, record enable, make sure it's destructive, pre and post roll. I will punch into these files right here and change the name on them. And so far, yeah, I've delivered probably six to 10 features uh, since I started doing this workflow. Haven't had a single issue with the files. The only issues I've had is when I've been a bonehead and I haven't renamed things or, you know, checked the punch or something like that. Those are all operator errors. But so far, 
But so far, it's been really good uh, to do that with Dropbox, just because Dropbox will sync somehow just the just the little piece that you update. So just the piece that you punch in, the five seconds, it will look at that that change in that wave file and just change it to that. And that's really cool. If you decide to do that, don't blame me if it gets screwed up. It's working for me. I don't know if it's going to work for everybody else, but it's really made my life a lot easier versus being like, oh man, I have to re-export this whole film just for this one little fix. And I just punch into the files on Dropbox. It updates, it syncs, and it's good to go. So I think that's it. There's uh, one deliverable that you might have in your list. You'll get this from the distributor or the production company when they hire you. At least they should. And that's called an optionals track. What an optionals track is, so the m &E, for example, the m &E is just the uh, basically the dialogue stripped out. So it's the music and effects. They'll use that for dubbing. They don't want the dialogue. They're going to do French or Portuguese or Farsi or whatever. So they don't need the dialogue. m &E is just a mix of everything that's not dialogue. But sometimes they want to have some stuff from the dialogue stem. For example, singing or um, some effort sometimes, like breathing or screams. Stuff that's not really spoken words goes on your optionals track. And you just set up a new uh, 5.1 or stereo or mono, whatever the spec sheet calls for. A lot of times I'll do a 5.0 optionals. And you can use the same routing as your dialogue track and just take it off your aux and have a couple of optionals tracks. What I'll do is I'll make, let's say, three mono optionals, and then copy your the plugins that you have from your dialogue tracks onto these. I don't think I used a de uh, And then set it out to the dialog aux, six track dialog aux in this case. And now if you have something like, hey, here's some breaths right here. Well, you just take that control alt, drag it up, copies all your automation over, and it routes it to a, what you can do for this is deactivate your dialog record stem and duplicate it and just call that dialog optionals. And then you've got your m and &E plus your optionals track all ready to go for the distributor. So that is how you do that. Sometimes they'll want multiple optionals tracks, but if you're mixing stuff at that level, you're not watching these videos. That's like, that's grown man stuff. So I would say don't worry about that right now. Uh, anything else about deliverables? Every once in a while, a company or a distributor will ask for your Pro Tools session, and some people get really nervous about that and they don't want to give it up because they think there's some magic pixie dust in their session that somebody will steal. Just do it. Just send it to them. Go file. Save copy in. Copy all your audio files. Slap it on a drive. You know, maybe charge extra for it or whatever. But I'm not super concerned about people having my session because there's no secrets in here. There's no magic that happens in my session. All the magic happens in between my ears and with the director. And that's something that you can't copy to a drive. So thank you for watching, and if I upload some more videos, I'll let you know.